Hi, book club members. I'm Jen. And I'm Carrie. And welcome to Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crack. This is episode number 64, and our book is The Hellwinter Gate by Chris Raitt. It is the conclusion to the Yarnhammer Pack saga, which started so very many years ago on a planet far, far away. We posted several questions on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, and we encourage participation in our conversations via YouTube, Twitter, our site, or Encrypted Vox channel. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read this book, go and check out the book and our questions, and then come back to this video as we're going to be discussing it from great from start to finish in great detail. Let's dive in. First off, did you like the book? Loved it. I loved this book so much. This, I am uh, so glad that we discovered before we started reading it that it was the third in a series, because otherwise I know it would have been like, yes. what the hell is going on? So f funny story, I think we would have sussed it out pretty quickly. By like the third chapter, we would have been like, what is going on? <laughs> like, because they keep referencing all these old events and stuff. We would have been like, uh, okay. Like it's, it's a little too much to be like, oh yes, this one time I had a lovely ham and cheese sandwich, but it's not plot relevant. Like it was just a little too much, right? Instead, it was there was this one time where Balder became a part of a demon ship. Remember that one time that he got put like awakened by a plague marine? Pepperidge Farms remembers. Y'all remembers. Like y'all definitely remembers. <laughs> oh my gosh! So um, what part stood out to you? Oh, let's see. I have to say, every single time they said "murder make," I laughed out loud. Like, <laughs> nice. But really, um, I really enjoyed some of the deeper commentary in it. Um, that's like, like Ingvar, when he was ruminating about everybody hates them. And he was like, is this us? Like, what is that? Is that, is that us? Because the ecclesiarchy hates us. The Inqui Inquisition hates us. The other chapters hate us. Like the Dark Angels, the Grey Knights. Like, is it us? And it's, um, and really kind of what he came down to and something that I kind of picked up from reading, um, oh, what was that book? The Emperor's Gift, that the wolves, even more than this, than the Ultramarines, are kind of the Astartes of the people. <laughs> like they really take yeah. the helping the people and remembering people and remembering that they're not Astartes better than anybody else. And, mm -hmm. and so I believe because they're out to protect the people, and I hate to say this, but the Inquisition and the Ecclesiarchy is not out to help the people. They're out to, they help, are not. They're out to help themselves. And so that's why I believe that they're hated. I mean, the Dark Angels come after them because, you know, it's, typical politics well they won't notice what's in our closet if we expose yours right type, type thing well and i liked there's one of my favorite quotes in this book is when ingvar is talking about the guard he's like talk with the guard sometimes he's like oh yeah like if you ask them about the primarchs they know sanguinius right mm -hmm. but you know they might know a couple others but when he's like if you mention lehman russ they smile and he's like they would much rather be in a trench with one of us screaming like a crazy person than a dark angel who can't be bothered to look at them. I actually love that comparison. Yeah. It's very apt, it really, right? I, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't disagree with it. Well, and especially since we got to see that paid off, it was kind of like Chekhov's gun. Uh, we got to see that paid off with Gunlager, right? Where he talks about bellowing and then all of a sudden the Cadians are screaming with him and he's like, there's power there. Mm -hmm. Like, all of a sudden they're fighting just a little bit harder and giving just a little bit more, right? Because yeah, who doesn't want to be with the crazy person? You're screaming all die defiance. Anyway, right? So <laughs> Might as well go out screaming with the werewolf next to you. But it was also... You know, like another reason why the wolf, the wolves are hated. You know, when he was talking, when he uh, Ingvar was uh, interrogating uh, Kurosti's assistant, basically. Please. Oh no, the girl. The uh, girl. 
Buta, Buta, Buta something. That's right. Buta. Mm-hmm. And 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 she and she said, you know, that that they have to be, you know, ex- purged. She's like, because you know, you guys were pure at one point in time, but you have you have deviated over time. And so to me, I was like, you know what? This is such a classic case of the priests that believe they know God's will. You know, yep. and in this case, like, well, we know what what the emperor wants. It's like, really? Do you know what the emperor wants? If he really thought that his space wolves had gone off the leash, don't you think a saint would have gone after them by now? Something. The custodies. The custodies. Like, you know, there there is yes. all these. There's all. You know, it, you know, one of my, uh, one of the old shows I watched, uh, uh, Gilmore Girls, there was this episode where this guy wanted to do a protest and they wouldn't let him do a protest because they're like, you don't know what the children will hear. Well, the church, like, well, you can protest here. And the town, like the head of the town was just like, you guys can't have let him protest at the, at this church. And they're like, why not? You know, he's not going to do anything bad. He's just going to hold a protest. And he's like, well, I know that God would not want it. And both the priests looked at him and was like, you know, does God talk to you? Man, I wish God would call me. Like, how do you find this out? Tot- that's totally what made me think of this when they were like, well, really it actually, believing. Right. It made me think of, because what he said, he's like, you're going against the emperor's work. It made me think of that scene that you and I both loved in Dark Imperium, where Robbie Bobby rips apart um, Freighter Matthew and mm-hmm. is like, I'm the only person here who's talked to my father in 10,000 years. Like, remember, because right. he's saying, he's like, oh, this is what the Emperor wants. And he's like, really? Have you talked to him? Because I have. Like, it made me think of that very much along with the lines right. with your point of them like oh well no 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 this is not what the emperor wanted no this is not what your arrogant ass thinks the emperor wants how like how do you know what the emperor wants? right again like have you talked to them gilmore girls did you call him on the phone like you had some conversation some conversation with you and don't give me the whole oh i saw him in a vision uh uh-uh. that doesn't hold up in court like ever <laughs> no. um i mean son of sam said the same thing yeah so (laughs) right so so there was all that and actually the space wolves thoughts on the heretic legions and i'm not talking about because they even talked about the numerous like the bands of like we don't care about that but they would talk about the old legions because i wrote this down there with the faithless of the old legions i like that was fascinating that's fascinating, but I also liked when Goonlogger was talking about like how selfish they were, basically. Right. Like you oh, were humanity's yeah. like, greatest star you had, and you threw it away. Right. I mean, I think I, basically he was, he was like, you know, you had everything mm-hmm. and you threw it away. Which, mm-hmm. like, I never thought about that way, but you're 100% correct. It's like that meme that has the, this is fine dog, <laughs> you know, on fire, like, this is fine. And then, like, in the 30K where it's like all sunshine and rainbows, this is terrible. <laughs> Exactly. And like the thing about it, it, I guess I never really pictured the space wolves being like a count your blessings kind of people. Um, But when he's basically saying he's like, you had everything and you threw it away for the whims of dark gods who don't care about you. Right. Like very God, much that was this. So great. Such a Well, great and that's line. what, so I don't think you have the, do you have the author introduction in your version? No. Okay. I'm going to have to like take pictures or scan it or something so you can read it because it's wonderful. Chris Raitt talks about how much he's grown as an author, but also how much he's come to appreciate the space wolves more. And basically one of the things he says is that he's like, they're this, this, there's this dichotomy of on one hand, they're these bellowing berserker warriors, right? right? Who don't give in a single F about what anybody thinks about them. But then on the other hand, they can be very deep and very thoughtful and very introspective. Like when they, when, as you said, when Gunlager and Ingvar are talking about why everybody hates him and they're like, maybe, maybe it is something that we're doing. But then he's like, you know, but oh, it's probably because we're doing something really good here. Like, you know, the fact that they can take the step back and be like, on one hand, screaming, opening their throat and bellowing out curses and invectives. But then on the other hand, being like, you sorry bastards. You're ungrateful. 
and churlish. <laughs> I mean, very much like how Lehman Russ was. And you very know, much. And even Logan Grimnar. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was very calm when he talked to the Inquisition. And then, next thing you know. No, he, for like three minutes. But even then, when the head fell off, it didn't look like he even moved because the axe was still back down where it was. And he was just like you were saying. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like, pretty much, right? Yeah. To, um, it, uh... You know, and that's actually one thing that um, even Lucas... Lucas, the trickster, uh, Mm -hmm. talked about, like, in the Lucas, the trickster book about, yeah, you know, he would actually comment on how some of the um, leaders were not introspective. Like, when he was, like, teaching the blood claws how to hunt, like, the kraken, and he knew that this guy was going to come in and claim it as his own. And that was, like, his lesson Mm -hmm. is, like, this is how it is. You can tell who doesn't think. Right. Right. And they they have this side of them that... I I have to disagree with the Death Guard because remember the Death Guard was like ugh I tire I bored of it with Lehman Russ and I bore of it with you right with this oh I'm just a berserker warrior no you're not um I think it's I like it it's I like that deceptive cunning to them right um this idea I also one of the other parts that really stood out to me that I really liked was when with it was actually with the Eldari when he's talking to the Eldari. Mm. And she refers to him as son of the Wolf King. Yeah. I really, I really like the nickname concept in general. So like Gunlager is Skull Hewer, right? And I love Ingvar as Gerfalcon and Olgir is Heavy Hand. And of course, Yorunder is the old dog. I just love that as a nickname, right? I like nicknames in general. So the Wolf King in particular, when she just, when she only refers to him as the Wolf King. I'm like, stop it. She was, she was an interesting scene too. Basically, where she's like, "Your people are awakening," mm-hmm. and the one thing that really stood out to me, and I wonder if we'll see more of it in play from her, what she said is when she was like, "Every race has to go through this test." Go on, <laughs> tell me more. Well, I also just kind of loved how she kind of bashed the rune priests. She kind of does, right? I mean, There's a, you know, and the way that the Eldari do without outright coming out and saying stuff, just the way that she put things is like, you know, they don't they don't know what they're talking about. They don't they don't understand. Uh, they're in denial. This is like, well, this is very interesting. It might have been stuff that I've been saying. Kind of, and yet We'll talk more about that when we talk about Balder in a second. Let's really quickly. So there has been six years between books, right? Six years between this and the second book. That's a long time. And in terms of Chris Rates writing for the Black Library, he's put out a couple books in those six years. How did this book compare to the earlier books, do you think? Well, I mean, it, you could tell that he's uh, got a little more experience uh under under his belt but um honestly i think they flowed pretty well for me i mean, like it was almost like he was just able just to kind of step right back in you know it's like when graham mcneil wrote uh the latest year of interest book it's like he just stepped right on in in his shoes it was like like nothing like it was just you know yesterday when he finished writing the sixth book type thing um I thought it was a lot subtler. I thought some of like the character dynamics, I liked that he had kind of grown past the Gunlager versus Ingvar thing. And like, you could tell that 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 is settled to me in the second book. Kind of, but he still kind of had like, I felt like Ingvar still kind of had this, I don't know how I feel about the space wolves still. Like, I still think we're kind of, I still have a lot of mixed feelings from the Death Guard. Whereas in this book, he was kind of like, like, I really liked when Ragnar was like, when I first saw you, you were... And Ingvar's like, I got better. <laughs> like, I liked that idea that they kind of put that to rest. That, it, again, in the author's introduction, he talks about how he's like, this is really more of Baldur's story, this book is. Because he's like, it kind of always was really about Baldur's story. Um, 
I like that they took the focus off of that. And instead, we get to see them as this pack really working together and really feel that friendship and kinship. I thought that was a really nice touch. I guess I just, I saw it already coming together in the end of the second book. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's just like, oh, it's just kind of more of the same. Mm -hmm. I liked, I, I thought it flowed a lot better too. I thought the story... It flowed a little easier, I thought. Um, I struggled with that first book a lot. And the second book, I was kind of, eh, it's good, it's not great, it's good. The first book was slow. It was just such a slow be slow beginning. It really was. It really was. Um, this book, I felt like this felt more like classic Chris Reed. Or, yeah. I guess not classic, or like what we've come to, well, come to expect for him. But at the same time, though, I would expect that of a third book to begin with. Because you don't have any more character introductions, right? Like... We already, True. We already have it. We're set. We already know know what we're doing. I would have been very disappointed if it was just as slow as as the first mm -hmm. book because then that's that's just not good writing at that point. Right. Because that says that oh maybe the author is not even sure what he's doing, or he's not comfortable with the characters yet if he's still like taking it very very slow. Right. But no, I mean, you know, once I got to about oh page like. 30 I think I was mm -hmm. like, well I'm all in like this is you know and even yeah. like, last night I was like oh like I only I have like 150 pages to read but I'm just going to get to you know, page 300 and I'm going to go to bed uh, yeah but then I was like I, I can't stop reading like, I've, got, I've got to finish this right I um, maybe blocked off some time on my work calendar today so that I could finish reading it aloud because I was like, I can't wait on this. I like it way too much. Um, it just, it, it definitely gripped me. And I was a little nervous about it, honestly, because he, at first, my first thought was that he ends it at the halfway point. Like with the whole fulcrum thing, which we'll talk more about in a minute. But when it gets like revealed and then it ends and I was like, you just ended the book and we still have like 200 pages left. What oh are you no, doing? we still had the whole thing with Balder, which. Yep. I got mixed feelings on that. Let's talk about Baldur's transition. So first off, let's just talk about his transition in general. What do you make of this whole thing? Like, what is he now? I have no idea. And I'm really disappointed that I don't know. Because he seems... He seems more than a rune priest, right? Like, he seems... He seems like a librarian. He does. Even though having I know that word is taboo, that, does that mean having witch? Having said that, <laughs> they've always said that there's this weird primal power on Fenris, right? That's more akin to, like, the old school. Like, if you're a Warhammer fantasy fan, they always made it sound more like the dwarven rune magic of it not being warp-based. There's, like, some sort of power on Fenris. And at first I was like, mm, I'm not really sure about that. But at the end there, when he's running with that big wolf and all of those animals, like all of the crows and everything else, I was like, this is something different. Like this feels different. Because even everybody else is like, what the? Heck? Like, yeah. that's, a, that's a figure from a myth. That, those, it, these are figures from myths. It kind of actually reminded me of um, Thousand Sons. But these aren't demons. Or spirits. They don't seem like it, I guess I should say. I say that, but then I'm like, or are they? I mean, the they Thousand don't... Sons didn't think they were either. They were just their familiars from the warp. But they were more of tutors. These definitely seemed more like manifestations or like representations of a power of something. <sighs> I don't know. I think I have mixed feelings on I love the way it. you you always talk out of this with Thousand Sons. It's fascinating. It, well, because it doesn't like it's they're not so like in the Thousand Sons, those beings were clearly sentient, right? Like those things had their own will and their own mind and they were tutors and they helped and they did stuff. These seemed like the ravens especially were just basically 
like manifestations of his power. Like he's just throwing them and they just happen to look like a raven because that's where his mind goes, I think. He's drawing on that symbolically, right? The big black wolf I don't know about. Is this some primal thing from Fenris? I don't know. Okay. Is so, it a familiar? This is I'm thinking. So let's think about Thousand Suns and let's think about our favorite Thousand Sun, Iskander. Didn't mm -hmm. he have a giant spirit dog? But that was, that demon possessed a dead wolf. That's what that was. It didn't mention this. Because remember, this is the wolf that looked at him as a child, too. I don't know. And it was interesting because remember Blackmane, Ragnar Blackmane sees it and is like, oh my god, it's the Blackmane of Fenris. Like, this is what I get my name from. This is a thing for them. I don't know what that means. Is this so, some like... All right, so it's a so we already know that Fenris is a death world. Um, yeah. There's a power there. There is a power there. We definitely know that. Just like there was one on Caliban. Yes. Here's the thing that's interesting to me about... But, like, on Caliban, Zinch was all too happy to claim for that, right? Like, oh, yeah, no, this is what this is. Nothing has come out and claimed Fenris. Like, same thing with uh, the... The Euro Trash Space Vampires. I call them that too many times. The Blood Angels. The Euro Trash Space Vampires. Right? Like, they have... Being a death world, right? They have this thing that's hounding them, but he's... I totally lost the name of that demon that hounds them, too. Bellicor. Bellicor. Thank you. Daddy Bellicor. Thank you, text-to-speech. All he is to me. Um, that has a name. That has claimed it. Nothing's really, at least not to my knowledge. And again, I don't really read the, I don't read the, uh, the, ch the campaign books. So I don't know, but nothing. You would think that something would be like, hey, that's me. You know what? I don't think so. And the reason why I don't think Maybe so is, is because the Space Wolves, they really like to cover up mistakes. Like, how is it that none of them know that Lehman Russ made a mistake in believing Horus? None of them know this. They are very quick to hide things. And since they have such mm -hmm. a fear of the warp and the weird and all of that, mm -hmm. if there really was something, I could totally see them covering that up over over the years because they don't want people tapping into it. And then maybe that's, that's why when they're like, oh, a witch, because that witch is tapping into that power. I, I guess I always, I think the other reason that I always want to make it to be more like the Warhammer Fantasy Dwarves, which that is established as not being warp magic, it's definitely rune magic, it's different. I think the reason is because of how heavily reliant they are on runes and like their totems and all of this stuff. <laughs> Excuse me, I just inhaled my water. Well, but... <clears throat> So, but we've seen other librarians also have, you know, items that, that, that they'll use. I'm telling you, the Space Wolves are just, they are such in denial and they're using the runes as an excuse. Could be. I think so, like at the end of the book, one of the things that I loved is when Old Gear is like, well, there's always more grudges. <laughs> they're so dwarven. Like they're just so dwarven. Because the dwarves were largely the Tolkien who made the blueprint, right? Largely based off Viking society or space Vikings. I feel like like a lot of times we call them the space Vikings, but I kind of feel like they're more like space dwarves. I don't know. That's one of those things. But I don't know what Balder is. Because even y'all was like, there's something not right here. Like you're not, you're not doing what I'm doing. Right? And remember, he couldn't sense it. And the Eldari, like, immediately picks up on it and is like, oh, yeah, you're awakening. Like, this is this is something different. I don't know. Does that mean, is it because he's awakened? But then the book, ah, okay, this is, the, this is where I keep going in circles because I'm like, okay, so he's definitely awakened and there was no latent psychic power in him because y'all definitely would have found it. However, 
when he's a child, that wolf, he encounters the wolf, remember? Mm -hmm. It's like this is something that's been in him latent for a while. Well, the whole talk about being God marked. I thought that was interesting, too, when they're screaming at him that he's God marked. You know, so again, makes me think of Caliban. Makes me think of um, Thousand Sons. Just how much the Space Wolves, they just don't want to admit, they don't want to admit that they're possibly like anybody else. That they possibly could have the yeah. same things. So them and the White Scars, same thing, because they don't have, they oh. don't have librarians either. And they don't use the warp. They have storm callers, oh, storm I'm, priests. I, I, yeah, and I have the, the, that same beef with the White Scars. The only reason why they get a slight pass is because they were on Magnus's side at the Council of Nakea. Yes, and that was... Yes. And there is, like, I keep wanting to think, like, I'm like, no, no, this is something definitely different. And yet, I do struggle. I do struggle with it. Because I think that, honestly, the reason why the White Scars have it different is because Jack of Tycon has been very vocal in that how we are different. And damn it, I'm going to make sure that we're different in every single way. Mm. It's the I think... kind of rebelliousness and something we even saw in Robbie McNiven's book with, with the White Scars about how they just mm -hmm. they don't want to do anything with the Imperium. They just want to be on their own and just like everything's such a burden to them. Right. All we want to yeah. do is go find our Primarch. Okay. Well, sorry, you're still part of the galaxy and all, but right sorry there's other stuff to be done friend um and we have too many space marine chapters that are off doing their own thing the dark angels say what's up like we need, i mean <laughs> we need more team players at least the space wolves show up to things right um i think really the only thing that separates the space wolves is that they clearly do have a fear of that rune magic they do have a fear of the use of it. And I did like that Balder was like, like when this, when the ghosts are trying to come into the tank and Olgir is like, you did nothing. And Balder like looks down at his hands and he's like, did you want me to do something? And Olgir is kind of like, really no. <laughs> like, he has to like take a step back and. Well, I did, but not with that. <laughs> Just wanted you right, to swing, exactly. Like to swing your yes, axe around, <laughs> but also no. Right, a very like, specific. You really, yes, <laughs> like a very specific. Yeah, exactly. Like something mild, um, something physical. Physical. Where does he go from here? I have he doesn't no go idea. Let me ask you this: Does he get off Cadia? Oh, isn't that just the big question, right? Yes. I, you know, because he was very uh, interested. Well, I'm gonna say yes. He gets off Cadia because he's got to return that soul that soul stone. Yes. Um. But he was very interested in the pylons, which we know mm -hmm. we know what what they are. Right. But he's you know was very very entranced by them. Yes. I don't know. I also kind of really enjoyed that he had the vision of Abaddon doing the parry this casual. <laughs> uh, yeah, when he's sitting there and all of a sudden he's like, oh yeah, this is not gonna, yeah. this isn't, this isn't gonna end well. No. I did, I did like that whole concept. Like when he would kind of get visions, I found it heartbreaking when he got the vision of Fenris from the Alpha Legion guy. And of course, Elgir's like, you can't trust anything those people say. And I'm like, normally I'd be with you. But. Mm, but. But. <laughs> like, and the idea that that's how long they've been gone. Right? Like, in the time that you've been away doing what you got sent off to do, and then your little, like, rebellious, we're going to help our friend thing. Oh, yeah. Some stuff happened on Fenris. Magnus attacked, the Dark Angels attacked, the Grey Knights showed up to 
fix the glitch. <laughs> right. Dark angels and space wolves and gray knights walk into a bar. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Pretty much. Um. Hmm. <laughs> Like, that's how much has happened in the time you've been gone. And that's going to be devastating for them when they finally do go home. We'll talk more about that in a second. But Balder, like, does he find his way home? Does he hook up with Robbie Bobby? Does he hook up with the Eldari? Well, actually, I was wondering, like, turns the soul stone. And he stays with the Eldari as his teachers, which is not going to help him get back to Fenris very well. Just to kind of figure out what he is and how to control what he does. And of course, then the question is, would they even help him? Unless it could benefit them in some way, of course. That, yes. I think it might go a long way if he's like, hey, I brought back What's-Her-Face's Soul Stone. Here you go. Like, that might go a long way toward it. But they would have to, like, one of the Farseers would have to be like, oh, you... I don't know. Well, if anyone, it would be, um, what's his name? Oathway. The one that brought yes. back Robbie Bobby. Like, mm -hmm. I could see him teaching him. Well, and she was with him. Because remember, she's like, I'm part of his. Well, yeah. I rec yeah, She was talking about his, basically his craft world. So, yes. Thought that she might have made mention of that, right? Oh, by the way, there's a Primarch here. Anywho. Or maybe she just knew. Maybe she was like, oh, you're one of the Wolf King's sons. You will not give a hot crap that Robbie G is here. Like, I was actually kind of hoping that we would get to see a glimpse of him. But I think he didn't wake up till after Kadia. But the most important thing about Kadia, no, because he's at Kadia. He shows up he on Kadia, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I could be, God, I could be conflating all of this I, stuff now. I really thought he didn't wake up until after Kadia. Like, I thought that Kadia, the fall of Kadia is what woke him up. I would have sworn that he was on Cadia. Um, but I could be wrong. I could totally be wrong. I mean, I, I was I, hoping that we would have at least gotten like I a, know hey. Every, I know everybody else something's was. Something's moving. <laughs> everybody else and their brother, which I did like, actually. Celestine. You know. So, talk. Let's do our questions a little out of the order there and talk about. This did provide another view of the last days of Cadia, right? Which I feel like is becoming... One of the things that I really liked about it was that it's a giant planet, right? And I think that kind of, it's kind of the planet of hats theory, right? <laughs> that like, when you think about a planet, oh, there's like, you know, like your city. But even then, if you think about like, because especially for you, because you live in Texas, if there's a war going on in Houston, you're not going to see it in Dallas. It's, that's a little bit of a distance, right? And like, if there was a war going on here like in Denver, a four hours, God, oh my God! Yeah. But like, if there was like a war or a skirmish, let's say a skirmish going on up here in Denver, you're not going to see that down in Dallas, right? If there's a skirmish going on in London, we're damn sure not a part of that. So I think I kind of like it, and it reminded me. I was like, oh, actually, like. This is a thing. Like, they're going to be able to re-examine. When you think about this globe, like, they're going to be able to re-examine all these little pockets of fighting that happened. Because as you said, everyone and their brother is there. Like, who doesn't show up? The Dark Angels. Um, I don't know if the Blood Angels were there. Surely Dante would have sent somebody. Because Dante's so. not a heel like that. No, no. But, like, when they said, like, everything's drawing towards Cadia, everything, right? I, it was interesting to me. Like, on one hand, I was like, ooh, maybe we could see this, or we could see this, or we could see this, or, like, maybe they'll make reference to the Cadian honor people. But then I was like, oh, yeah, it's, it's a planet. They could have been fighting in Denver where all the other people are over in, like, the United Arab Emirates. Mm-hmm. Like, they're literally on the other side of the world from us. It's... I forget. Planets are, like, big and stuff. Oh, Again, which is actually, a... like, one of the problems I often have while reading the Warhammer 40k universe is about, you know, I feel like sometimes they forget how big a planet is. Right. You know, when they talk about a planet, you know, a planetary governor, sure, Jan. Mm -hmm. Sure, Jan. 
Like, because that's all going to work right. across the entire planet. And it's just different things like how messages get across an entire planet and how everyone travels across the whole planet. Mm-hmm. It's like sometimes the planet is big and sometimes it's like a country. Right. And that's like kind of my little beef I have with the Warhammer 40k universe, which I understand why it's like that. Because I think a lot of sci-fi universes are like that to begin with because they're going to have like all these planets and you can't it's where the planet of hats trope comes from right i've never heard the planet of hats trope it's basically the idea that like oh well you know on this planet everybody wears a hat we all wear bowler hats because that's what our planet does forgetting that like when you think about like earth i i dare you other than the fact that we're all human beings i dare you to find one cultural thing that would express the entire planet. We all eat. We all breathe. Like, at that point, you're getting into, like, organic things, right? right. Um, we all fall in hats. love. Like, it, it, it falls into that where you basically have to boil down to, like, oh, yes, on this planet, we all wear pink. Because it's the Wednesday planet. Like, you have to... I, I think you're right. And I do like the books where they're like, here's the planetary governor, but then here's all of the little political people who are under this person that roll up to this person. And this is where things are starting to go kind of bad. And like, I like those kind of things. Cause you're like, Oh, this makes sense. Like you could declare somebody to be like, Oh, you're the planetary governor. Uh, but there's still like a very complex, <laughs> like right. a very deeply complex. Right. Um, that makes it a little, I think you're right. I think sometimes it gets a little too kind of like, and this is one of those things, as you said, you can make this argument about sci-fi. Like what is the capital of the world in every sci-fi movie? New York city, right? Like basically there's New York city and then a cornfield in Kansas. I don't know what's on this planet. Like that's pretty much how that works. It's hard. It's hard to do that global scale. And that's one of the things I think I'm really starting to like about Cadia. Is that you can be like, oh yeah, by the way, did you know the wolves were there? They totally were. They were in these tunnels. Who knew? You can be like, oh, well, that makes sense. But did you like the wolves being there? Did you like them ultimately ending up on Cadia? I think it made the most sense. Bring the story into the current timeline. Right. Which, um, you know, because, I mean, I, it'd be, it is very hard and it would be very hard to write a book that takes place in the before times. <laughs> right. Especially especially if you want to keep it relevant to what's going on now. So I think he had to, he had to make this, unless it's about the Horus heresy, he had to make this connect to the present times somehow. And connecting it to Cadia makes the most sense. It does. And it also... It also is smart because it doesn't progress the plot at all. Like the overarching plot of Warhammer. This does not end up with a call to Robbie Bobby at all. No. This was wolves business and the wolves took care of it. Right? Like, um, or did they? Um, I assume they do. We'll talk about that in a second. But it, 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 it brought it up to the current time. There's still room technically for them to do something, which again, we'll talk about in a minute, but like, all right, now you're up in the current times. Mm-hmm. And it was, again, it was kind of fun because we knew that Ragnar Blackmane was on Kadia, but it was kind of fun to see him there and to know that he almost got killed. Well, you know, if there's going to be a huge galactic battle, Ragnar Blackmane will be there. Uh, yeah. I did like when he was talking about first off I like that they call Cadia the Hellwinter Gate that's like the most badass name I've ever heard of yeah when they talked about it I was like okay so what is this Hellwinter Gate and then they talked about when they explained what it was and they're like and that's why we call it this like that makes the most sense ever especially thinking back to the Horus Heresy because that's where it all started and like yes this is the gate that shields it all you know what 100 percent. it's always been that way that's why the people got the purple it. eyes i did like uh when ragnar is like oh man this feels like the end of things and ingvar is like nah lehman russ will be back for the end of the things and he's like that's a good point <laughs> it's just the wolves right it's just their kind of gallows humor and gallows well, view of the world shit lehman russ could have been there not like they would have known <laughs> 
right to be on the other side of the planet like what we were saying right like all of a sudden somebody could absolutely come back and be like so fun fact lehman russ was on cadia and again i would be like makes sense was he there talking with the lion because that would also make sense with jagatai khan yeah they were there they just like saw robbie and were like oh he can deal with all of this we're just gonna exit stage left (laughs) absolutely could see them all being like that looks dangerous (laughs) let bob take it well this sucks (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right like oh this is what happened to our world of peace and prosperity that we envisioned before the heresy good luck bob we're with you in spirit i don't even think they really are there either so let's talk about the big midway point reveal in this which is the fulcrum first off what did you make of the fulcrum i kind of laughed because I can totally imagine it, and it makes total sense that some person in the ecclesiarchy would be this petty. God, it was so... That is the best word for it. When he was basically like, yeah, we tried to attack your world, and you sent us packing, so um, we're just going to kill all your great heroes. Well, I think well the way he put it was like, we just wanted to come and talk, and they said no, and then he got all pissy. Because, like, when they said, like, how you treated us, and, like, they told you you couldn't come down there. Well, that mean, that must mean that they are hiding something. So, therefore, we're going to come and attack. And they're like, oh, the War of Fools. <laughs> like, the Invasion of Fools is what it was. <laughs> like, that's amazing. That is, and I love how the guy's like, oh, that's what you call it? I'm like, that's the most space wolf thing, like the most Fenrisian name to give it. Like, Cadia is the Hell Winter Gate. Y'all were the incursion of fools. What? what? Loved it. Um, because it was all about not letting him on the planet. Have we seen that before? Jeez, I don't know. Maybe it was the but it seems. Guest. It just seems to be a common theme with the Space Wolves, right? They are definitely the rowdy, flipping the finger, giving the two-finger salute to every person who shows up, right? And is like, uh, well, because we want to uh, come take a look. Because the rock is so hospitable for visitors. I mean, let, let's be real here. No one's really allowed there totally. either. But uh, I feel like the Dark Angels would at least be like, oh, thank you for visiting. It's really awesome. Thanks for coming. Yes, you're totally welcome to come down, but we're just a little busy right now. Could you come back? Whereas the Space Wolves are like, no. Well, I think that the Space Wolves, I think that might be also one of their unwritten rules from way back in the day. You know? Mm -hmm. Also, I also strongly believe that because they hold, you know, that the Emperor is not a god stronger than most other uh, legions. Most other loyal legions. Mm Mm-hmm. They aren't going to care about the Inquisition or the Ecclesiarchy's opinions. No. And I think that's a big part of it, too, is that to them, the Ecclesiarchy are doing what... Oh, I did love that, too, when um, Buddha is talking with Ingvar and she's like, there's always been a church. And he's like, actually... Oh, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, no, there's always been a church sure jan like you're dying so whatever but no like i would argue with you but i need other information from you before you die yes. so <laughs> i got more important things to bug you about lady um <laughs> but no you're absolutely correct that there is a big part of that too where they're just like look the emperor is not a god and you people you guys need to slow your roll right we damn sure don't uh, answer to you guys because you're a cult Whereas the Inquisition are just a bunch of upstart assholes. They didn't even want re- remembrancers hanging out no. with them. Mm-mm. I mean, and that was something the Emperor asked everybody. you got to have some re- remembrancers because we're going to immortalize all of this in history. And even they yeah. were just like, no. And no, we're let, good. And they let uh, Casper 
there, but only after they mm-hmm. removed his biotic eye. Yes. Well, and because they kind of quickly figured out that, oh, something's not right with you. Mm-hmm. We, need to, we need to watch you, <laughs> right? But it's a funny dichotomy with them. Again, they're, they're like this legion of contradictions because on one hand, they care so deeply about helping Imperial citizens. We saw that with the Imperial's gift. We see it here with some of the stuff Ingvar says. We see it with some of his, pre- in the previous books, we saw with some of the tortured stuff that he had from the Death Watch. Like, we see Lucas all the of these trickster. things. Lucas the trickster. And yet, as much as they like the common people, they hate bureaucracy. And the remembrancers, I think they looked at as kind of like hoity-toity. I think it's also that the, the wolves just don't want anybody up in their grill. <laughs> they really don't, right? <laughs> like, we look, we, we've we got, we, we're handled, okay? We've got our stuff together. We don't, we have skulls that tell stories. We don't need the remembrancers. Like, we are a right. self-contained I, unit. And also, we do us. Also, I think that part of it also is probably because they know that they do the dirty work. Yes. So they don't and they are rem- not afraid to do it. So they don't need these remembrancers, you know, coming in and mm-hmm. being like, so, like, you know, getting the vapors because of all these horrible things that they have to do. Um, and also, they're probably also wondering, like, what good would it do for the Inquisition or the Ecclesiarchy to come down to Fenris? Well, first of all, they'd probably all freeze to death. Yeah. You're not going to like our place, which I think would also offend them, right? Because you would have, like, these Ecclesiarchy members who are, like, wearing all of their furs and complaining and just being like, oh, it's so cold here. Being like, I could fat, absolutely. And they have, like, you know, some of the beasts of Fenris is like... I bet we could take that. <laughs> right, exactly. I want that. I want to wear that thing's fur. It looks a lot warmer than what I'm wearing right now. Like, I think that whole concept would offend them. But one of the things I was thinking about is when you think about the Inquisition, right? When they're like, we do all the dirty work. We get all the crap jobs. We do the stuff that nobody else wants to do. Arguably, when Grevnar kills that Lord Inquisitor, right? He's He weighed it and was like, all right, somebody's got to take this guy out. Looks like it's gonna be me. I mean, he let the guy say his say his spiel. He did. Like, he did. Like, which mm-hmm. I'm taking that I under guess. advisement, and I say no. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Have a nice day in death. Um, there is there's something to that, and I don't think they like to be dictated to. And I think they do realize, as you said, I think they realize that people are. N- not going to understand some of the stuff that they do additionally there is the whole wolfen thing you know there are no wolves on fenris i do believe there's one person who would understand Mm. the space wolves and i think he does and that is robbie bobby that's why he hasn't Mm -hmm. gone there it's why he hasn't done anything because he knows that they will help when they're when they are needed right and i think he knows that and he has such great respect for russ an understanding mm-hmm. of the space wolves like because again yes. Robbie Bobby is the ultimate diplomat here that's very much so that's why he's alive and they the lion is not <laughs> pretty much I yes I think you're correct and I think he knows that they would not appreciate him showing up to be like hey so I'm kind of in charge now uh, you're going to answer to me now. Like, I think he knows that's not going to go well. Like, part of me wonders if he's, like, he dropped off the Primaris to them and he's like, let's, let's talk when you're ready. Right. I, I got a bunch of other stuff I got to go deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, I do think he's not going to like, once he discovers some of the stuff that's been happening to the Space Wolves, I don't think he's going to like that. He already has very tense relationships with the Inquisition and the Ecclesiarchy. Um, you know what we forgot to talk about really quickly and what parts stood out since we're talking about Robbie? When Kalamakis shows up. Kalamakis is my man. Dude, and that was, Kalamakis, I nerded That was probably out. my uh, favorite scene. When he's like, I recognize the I didn't. I was like, oh, he's not going to. <laughs> and guess what? He did. Loved it. And Absolutely his, loved it. And his little it. commentary is like, you still never learned gothic, right? Did you? <laughs> just, just. I loved that. And he's like, oh, 
God, he was such a good friend, but God, he was a headache too. Right. <laughs> he was my biggest problem and my greatest asset. Right. Like, which is like the Space Wolves in a nutshell. Right. And that's such an ultramarine <laughs> thing to say, just because he's so diplomatic about it. It's like, oh, you know, he such a good asset. And man, you were <laughs> pain in the ass. You're such a pain in the butt. Like, can't you just do what you're told for once? It's like, is that um, you and that ship? Oh my god, I absolutely uh, love that. We better have Calamacus, Calamacus come back, reappear oh, somewhere. Any of these characters, but I would love to see Calamacus appear for sure. Because he was such a neat character, and I felt like we like knew him just from everything that Ingvar had said. I was like, oh, I really you. liked uh, the Trojan horse he set up. Just, I'm just firing around you guys, just hide in the, <laughs> hide in the bullets. <laughs> so amazing when they talk about like the screen going white <laughs> like oh my god so focusing do you think this ends their problems with the ecclesiarchy or oh, is this no. just one of many like on the list they just scratched out one of the grudges so i mean one thing i will say though is that um so that one ecclesia the one cardinal that came in to take care of um Christaris, mm -hmm. and uh he was just like look the space wolves may be a problem, but they're not our, that's not up to us to decide. Like they're the emperor's creation. Like, okay, see, at least he gets it. He gets it more than the inquisition. I gets it. loved that actually. Cause I was kind of worried when he showed up and they talked about him being in that golden armor. I was like, Oh gee, this right. is going to not go well. But then when he was like, yeah, I'm uh, I'm hunting this bastard because you're not going to believe this, but he's been attacking the Space Wolves, a first founding chapter. Can you believe that? And Clave is like, no, you know, hey, go on. Someone would do that. What? And especially when he's just like, yeah, but I guess people didn't really know who they were taking orders from. And he's like, wow. Like, huh. It was deeply satisfying to me when he's when that guy's like, oh, but you've told me so many lies already, and I am very cross from this whole experience. He would have gotten away with it too. It wasn't for those meddling wolves. <laughs> <laughs> like I left them a present. I yeah, was like, oh, so great! Like in like in plain sight. In plain sight. When and when he says he's like, huh, it's so weird that they would have just left this where we would have most definitely have found it. So I liked the idea because I feel like a lot of times we see, I feel like lately we either see a lot of ecclesiarchy members who are just outright corrupt or just inept, or we see just mixed feelings. And yes, I'm looking squarely at you, Freighter Matthew, um, where it's like, ugh, what is going on with this guy? I don't really understand it. Like, I feel like we don't really get to see the ecclesiarchy in a great light. So the fact that there was a guy who's just like, well, look, I don't like them either, but you cannot kill a first founding chapter. These are the emperor's angels. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't gotta like them. We just, this is not our place, though. I was like, oh, okay, well, that's good. So a they're not all awful. A cardinal who gets it. Can you go find more mm. cardinals like you and get rid of the other ones? Seriously, asking for a friend. That made me very excited to see. Like, that was actually, that was a nice little subversion of expectations. Because when they're describing yes, him with the armor and stuff, I was like, well, we all know where this is going. And then they didn't. So thank you. Were you satisfied in Karasti's end? Uh, I mean... He ended the way a madman would, you know. Yes, he, he took, took the poison, but the whole time he's like, and I won. I won. At the same time, like, when they're looking through all his journals, it's like, you didn't even know who you were talking about half the time. Like, you were accusing someone who was, someone of being there who was dead six years prior. Or people who weren't even born yet, just because you, you didn't understand some of the call signs. You were just kind of piecing things together from our cant. Mm -hmm. So we said, you know, was it? A black mane thunder fist and they're all like who <laughs> it's that when they're like the name is black mane thunder fist and that's the first reaction who like it but i think that pissed me off even more because i'm like you have been killing people who 
may or may not have even been there. Like, you're going to go and kill Ragnar Blackmane, who wasn't born was, yet, as they wasn't even there. As they explain this, like, yeah, he because they think they're talking about Thunderfist. They're like, well, Thunderfist was already dead, right? By the time of this, and this comes around, yeah. And Ragnar wasn't even born yet. Mm -mm. So no, and I think that actually made me a little angrier yeah i'm like are you serious you guys are not even good like you're not even competent villains you're just jerks like you can't even call them like because again like i feel like we've seen and i'm not saying like he was a badly written villain it was just frustrating because like you're not even good you're not even good at being bad i guess what i'm saying is he sucked I didn't like him. No, but and I'm was, glad he's dead. He was very smart about how he handled it, though, that no one knew. <sighs> Unfortunately. No one knew who it was. Mm -hmm. Just kind of put out his orders. Yep. No, unfortunately, he was competent in that. Uh, his targets were just all wrong. But it was so frustrating because I'm like, all of this death and destruction that you've caused. And over a perceived slight. But, and you and I have talked about this a lot, because this comes up as a theme, I think, a lot in Warhammer 40k, and that is how dangerous one powerful person can be, mm -hmm. and how much havoc they can wreak. Because you can't question this man, that's heretical, right? Like, and, like, with Buddha, like, she's, she buys into this when she's like, you're a devil. And he's like, <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm not. I am I am the Emperor's wrath made manifest and mm -hmm. she's just like maybe once, but you're a devil now. Really? Why are we the devil? Because we wouldn't let you on our planet. Irks. <laughs> just ugh. I mean if they wanted to go on ball, I'm sure Dante would be like, Well, okay, but but why though? <laughs> <laughs> right. I have imagined he would just be like, Can we do this later? Like do you really want to come here? I mean, we have water that's actually a monster. <laughs> that will kill you I come to you. Try to drink it. Like, yeah. do you really want to come here? In case y'all can't I tell, I have never gotten over this monster on ball, the water. Never that's gotten fair. over it. That's fair. But I, I just, I feel like. I feel like a lot of the other chapters, like Dante, I could imagine being like, yes, you're welcome to come down here. We're just a little busy. Hang out with some of our, like some of these people for a bit. And we'll get back to you in like, I don't know, like three or four years. Your and we'll, um, we'll see you now. <laughs> like, I feel like the other chapters would, they wouldn't like be like, oh yeah, come on in, come on in. Just make yourself at home, put your feet up. Uh, but that they would at least, they wouldn't quite as abrupt as the Space Wolves who are just like knobby. I feel like there'd be just a little bit, a little bit more right to them, but I don't know. I, maybe I just, uh, again, the space wolves are occasionally their own worst enemy. Right. Which, which is a little frustrating. Which we've said that about the ecclesiarchy and the uh, inquisition as well. Right. The I mean, at this the point. The council of 12, you know, they're all their own worst enemy. Pretty much. So what becomes of Shit. Yarnhammer now? Even the Emperor was his own worst enemy oh. in the end. God, I that's mean, the truth. That is 100% the truth. But where do they go from here now? They have this brand new shiny ship. They have all of their Carls. I, like, was giddy when Bjargborn oh. and Ben Cliss. Okay, when Bjargborn, he made it, I was like, thank God. Well, and that they have Van Cliss as their navigator. I oh, was she's, like... <laughs> she's so awesome. I loved the hell out of her. And I loved that she befriended Balder. I loved... I I liked everything about her. She was like a grandmother to him. You know, he kind of... She kind of was, she's like, right? come sit next to me, Sonny. Right, exactly. Where she's like, oh, come on, come sit and let's talk about all the things. And uh, when he's like... I. I think I could help you. And she's like, hmm, those are some pretty wild dreams you have. That okay. would be bad what you're offering to do right now. And he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I liked that idea that she's, she was kind of like 
she wasn't just like, I'm sorry, what did you just suggest? Mm, that's that's not a good thing that you just suggested to me. Like, because she recognizes that he doesn't know. He doesn't understand. So happy that she made it. Yeah, same. Like, so happy. I like my random navigator characters. <laughs> but where do they go from here? Good question. Um, do they go do try they... to find Balder? I don't know. Do they... I could see Blackmane letting them go. It's got to keep it from Nihal. You know, I and, really liked that. When and, he was like, oh, I told him you guys were busy. Because you are. So, I mean, because you're not going to mess with Blackmane because he's pretty much the, um, the heir to the throne. Well, and technically they're part of Black Mane's great company, right? So well, right. they kind of fall under his jurisdiction. So when he's like, oh yeah, I, uh, sorry, I totally forgot that they were in trouble. They were just too busy to come back and see you. You know how it goes. But it's, it's part of what I like about the wolves in general. Like, oh, did you want them back because you're mad at them? <laughs> yeah, they're busy. Like, there's that little bit, they're always walking that line between outright, mm -hmm. like, mm, I'm thumbing my nose at you, and I liked the idea that he's like, okay, look, you've pretty much redeemed yourself to me <laughs> for right. saving my life. Well, and then who's going to go appeal to uh, Grimnar? Black Mane. Right. They're gonna, he's gonna listen to Black Mane, because again, like I said, he's pretty much the heir to the throne. He's the heir apparent, right? Yes, so... Kind of like Titus. Whoa, not Titus. That was the wrong, wrong name. I'm so sorry. It's Titus. Too Titus should be. <laughs> but no, it's he, Carlos Sicarius. He, Carlos Sicarius. Um, <laughs> I don't know where Titus came from. <laughs> from wishes. <laughs> wishes. Never gonna let that dream die. We're gonna get a Space Marine too someday. THQ is gonna get the band back together. Pour one out. Just keep drinking. I drink. I drink to forget. <laughs> um, <laughs> Space Marine too. Um, my Titus. But yes, Kato. 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 I can't handle Kato because it has to be said in a. It has to be said in a staccato voice. Well, shit. Crap. <laughs> Hi, Kato. I mean, I can't say Kato without being like Kato Sicarius. Hey, Kato Sicarius. You just you can't. Or I picture him as the cat with the. Hi, Kato Sicarius. But you're right. I'm pooping. Nobody's in your gonna. Armor. <laughs> oh my god. Nobody is gonna second. Nobody's no. gonna question the young king, right? And nobody is going to second guess him there so yarnheimer is pretty much free to i guess and i mean there's just the four of them so gonna go, go off cream. and gonna go i guess like send us another blood claw when you get a chance um, oh my god what if lucas joined them that could be hysterical i mean because he's still technically a blood claw how hosed are the Base wolves when they're sending Lucas out. I don't know. I think Lucas. I mean, I kind of think Lucas would actually fit in with this. Bunch uh, he of would. Rabble. He would, and they might actually promote him, and he'd be like, "I don't know what to do with myself." I know he would just be like, "But I did like when Halfway when he when Ingvar is like, all right, Grey Hunter,' and Halfway's like, "I'm not, I'm not a Grey Hunter yet," and he's like, "I don't know what else to call you at this point, man," and he's just like, "But." But no, 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 I'm not ready for that. Dude, I'm not arguing with Ingvar. I like Ingvar. Ingvar look, looks like he knows what he's talking about. Well, at the same time, though, doesn't that mean that Hefloy is ready? Because at the beginning, he thought he was ready, right? Right. What I liked, like, when they talk about running, mm -hmm. and he's like, I'm just just not quite as sure-footed as these guys. Like, I still am Bloodclaw. I still am. And it's so weird to think about this grown killing machine still kind of being like, oh, I'm just not quite there yet. Like, that's, it, it's just, it's kind of weird to think about. I, 
I just, I loved this book. I went into it, like, I was really wanting to like it because it's Chris Wright and the Space Wolves, and we knew that it was new, and I will not stop flashing the foil on this special edition that a really awesome person got for me. Um, I love this so much. Uh, but I, like, was so pleasantly surprised by how much I liked this, even though I will never forgive Chris Wright for killing the old dog. And for making me hate a world eater character. I got so excited. I was like, wolves and world eaters. This is going to be awesome. And then one of them killed the old dog. And his ship couldn't die alone. He had to go down with the ship. I'm going to get to see Chris Rate someday, like when we go to Warhammer World. I'm going to get to see him, and I'm going to be so torn between being like, thank you for giant soulless babies, but you bastard. <laughs> like, can I have you re-sign this book for me? But I want you to know that you're a bastard. He old yellered him. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it is totally okay. It's actually what I thought, because he said old dog. I was like, oh man, you mean old yeller? Instead of taking them out behind the shed, they shanked him, they shish kebobbed him by a world eater? All I could actually think about was in Deadpool, that first Deadpool movie when he's just like, I know what you're thinking. This is supposed to be a romance, but that guy just shish kebobbed that guy. You can't. <gasps> and then suddenly I didn't like the world eaters, and then I was like, I don't know what to do with myself, and I have very mixed feelings about Chris Wright right now. I mean... Th Honestly, the bastard made me like the Space Wolves. I don't know how I feel about him right now. Worst book ever! They killed the old dog, but also really good. 10 out of 10 would read again. <laughs> but also 2 out of 10, because you don't kill the old dog. I did like when half Loy's like, I'll fly the ship. I was like, you little... You should do that. Sometimes old dogs gotta be put down. <gasps> Still had some fight in him. Apparently not. Too slow. <laughs> American audiences, given that we are moving into Thanksgiving this week, and then we have Christmas, like, right around the corner. Jen is uh, no and given, longer thankful for me. <laughs> I am no longer thankful for Carrie. Uh, my partner in crime is now just straight up a criminal. Mm. Uh, <laughs> Picking puppies. Uh, we are going to, we originally were going to try and read Wolf Time, but Games Workshop's having some shipping issues. And given that it's the holidays and given all of this stuff that's going on, our next book, neither of us have the physical copy, we're reading it digitally, uh, is Da Gabo's Revenge by Mike Brooks. It is the story of the Red Gabo, which makes it kind of holiday ish in that very Warhammer 40k kind of way. Uh, it's a Christmas miracle. So oh, I'm actually really excited. Miracle. It's a sanguinella miracle that doesn't involve St. Celestine and Daddy Bellicor. Uh, I'm really excited for it. It'll be our last book that we read before we do our Book of the Year awards to wrap up 2021, which I still don't quite know how we're at November 2021. But hey, hopefully by then we'll get the wolf time. I hope so, so that we can start the new year off on the right note with more Spess Wolves. I'm really excited, though, to see uh, Brutal Cunning totally sold me on Mike Brooks's handling of the orcs. I'm really excited to see what he does with the Gabo. And to see how he becomes a Christmas miracle. It better be funny. That's all I have to say. Oh, you know it's going to be. It should be. It's the orcs. But not only that, oh. but it's the Gabo. So it should be funny rising in the ranks to become a legendary icon of gabo culture well definitely spelled with a k and no e on the end oh, i am yeah. i mean duh. so excited for it i think it'll be a really fun good way to launch into the holidays before we try to figure out our book club awards and figure out like what was the best thing that we read this year suddenly it all sucks i hated all of it all right, that just made that just made my votes easy. <laughs> okay, Adam. How dare you? 
Uh, honestly, I'm not going to lie to you. This might have just skyrocketed to the top of my list. I don't know. I have text messages from you that say it differently. I was clearly being sarcastic because they killed my old dog. And when I thought Gunlager was dead. I'm not sure how, oh. how I can take a whole bunch, like a whole row of crying emoji to be sarcastic. Because they, they killed Gunlager. He got better. And he was, he got better. I don't really know how, but I'm willing to forgive it because he's better. And, um, 10 out of 10 would read again. Except for the part where the old dog dies. I'm just going to pretend that part never happened. They're going to like crash into the river and then all of a sudden they're going to be in the tunnels and the old dog is busy filling the, fixing the Volgo back with the Cadians. That's my head cannon. And then they need half Lloyd to fly the ship because the old dog stayed with the Cadians to go find Balder. There you and, go. Here's and, my head and, cannon. And uh, what happened to Cadia? Oh, it broke. So then they're going to need a lot of flex tape. <laughs> I'm not sure yep. if flex tape could put that place back together. No, like good hopes. It's like Tinkerbell. <laughs> if we all believe. <laughs> all right. Wow. Oh, check us out, Carrie. Yeah, it, it's definitely time. All right, so you've listened to the Warhammer 40k book club episode regarding uh, Hellwinter Gate by Chris Reit. Hey, that kind of rhymes. It Be does. sure to join us for our next book, Dagabo's Revenge by Mike Brooks. We are an unofficial book club and not affiliated with the Black Library or any of its affiliates. You can find both the vidcast and podcast on our website, wh40kbookclub.com. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe, give a review, and all those good things to the vidcast on YouTube or the podcast on anywhere you get podcasts. Our site also has articles about our adventures in reading other Warhammer 40k books and short stories outside of the book club books. So please stay a while and read from a crack. And I'm still off areas. Get you some chartreuse or get you the, oh, shiza, the other shade of a chartreuse that I need to put up there. You got some options in the chartreuse market right now. You just weren't prepared chartreuse today, is, were you? Chartreuse is very, very in. Just, I'm, I, dis I'm disappointed in how unprepared you were for this episode today. So sorry. I'm so sad about the old dog. <laughs> get you some sad chartreuse. She's never going to get over old yeller, people. Y'all, I'm not. Tell us who sued on old yeller. God, That's... what are you going to do next? Talk about where the red fern grows and about how the puppies okay. deserve to die? Okay, first of all, we don't talk about where the red fern grows. That's where... Oh, That's... I'm sorry, no! Oh, That's look at this That's where the limit now. is. <laughs> That's where Good the limit is. God, I don't give a shit about those red ferns. <gasps> <gasps> Good hurt. Good night, everybody. Words hurt. Dan and Anne to live on, okay? You're a monster. Good night. The red ferns that are dead.